Well, special thanks for the invitation to speak at this august body, and thank you to the students for joining. Dr. Norden, thank you so much for your help and, and uh, the arrangements for this great symposium. I began thinking about the interaction of light with matter in thinking about a very simple interaction. If a donor, which I've called D, a molecule which is electron rich, interacts with an acceptor, which I've called A, a molecule which is electron deficient, plus minus combinations will bring these two together in a way that you can have different products. You can look at the energetics, you can look at the separation between them, you can look at the composition of something that might covalently bond the donor and acceptor. You can look at super exchange, you can look at reorganization and solvation and the exchange of an electron either in one direction or in the other. In other words, photo-induced electron transfer is a very simple way of having two reagents combine and if they don't combine directly, by activating with light you can get all sorts of different uh, reactivity. It's very simple to think of it in this way. Think, for example, about a molecule, and that molecule is characterized by a number of filled orbitals, which are indicated by horizontal lines, and electrons, which are indicated by vertical lines. If light is absorbed in this system, one electron is promoted from the highest occupied orbital to the lowest unoccupied orbital. So you can see in this way that an excited state has a vacancy in what was filled and it has an extra electron in an orbital which was empty. This can also go intersystem crossing from the singlet state where both the spins are paired, shown by arrows here, or it can cross over to the triplet state. But the key thing that you see when you think about absorption of a photon in photochemistry, that branch of science that you must understand if we're to do something practical for solar energy conversion, is the singly occupied orbitals, one which was unoccupied to begin with and one which was occupied fully to begin with. So if we think about that, compare this situation to one in, in which the absorption of a photon promotes an electron from the highest occupied orbital to the lowest unoccupied one. Compare that, for example, to what you would have if you simply had added an electron to the original starting position see that that's similar to the one at its, at its uh, left. Or if you had removed an electron, you can see that it would create a deficiency in that what was originally the highest occupied molecular orbital. So compare the second structure to the third. This very simplified picture explains why it is that photochemistry of necessity is very much like electrochemistry. By adding an electron to reduce a molecule, you can get the same orbital occupancy that you could from an excited state. Or removing an electron from the highest occupied orbital gives you a hole which can be filled by placing an electron into it. Now recognizing this correspondence between electricity, electrochemistry, and photochemistry, I bet many of you at, in your elementary schools had, did an experiment where you had two pipettes filled with water and you would put an electrical charge across those two electrodes until the water began to bubble. At least that's what you thought when you were a child. In fact, the water did begin to bubble because water was split, generating hydrogen and oxygen on opposite electrodes. <coughs> now, the, the trick of that is to do this by not using an applied electric field or electric, electric potential, but rather instead to reduce the amount of energy which is required to generate by water splitting hydrogen and oxygen and to do that by having some source of irradiation. So suppose instead of having one pipette with a metal electrode which will be quenched if it's exposed to a photon, suppose the other one is an oxide, an oxide for example like titanium dioxide which can absorb light. Fujishima and Honda in 1974 showed that it was possible to do exactly that experiment and to reduce the amount of electricity that's necessary to achieve this water splitting. 
was a very important observation and one which has been carried out in many ways since then. One th consequence of doing it this way is to recognize that if you have a chemical molecule, I guess all molecules are chemical, uh, the distribution that one has in an oxidation reaction will be quite different if it's generated in solution or if it's generated on a particle, like a soot particle or an aerosol, or whether it's on a solid. We showed in 1979 in a science article that it was possible to use ultraviolet light to differentiate reaction paths that would be followed by various uh, electrodes. In other words, what the solid was doing was trapping the excited state and allowing chemical reactions to take place. We could also du duplicate this sort of trapping interaction by looking at a very simple reaction in solution. Here what you have is two phenyl rings on, the, on one side of ethylene. And you find that if you expose this to an electron, you can oxidize, I'm sorry, take away an electron by oxidation. What you can generate is a species which is now positively charged. And this positively charged species has a, a dot. That dot represents a radical or an unpaired electron state. If the dots of those two intermediates form a chemical bond, a carbon-carbon bond, you get a dication which is completely different than what you see in the second and third line. For example, if you do the same oxidation on the second line, what you see is the radical per se, which can undergo different reactivity, extracting a hydrogen atom, for example, for full reduction. And as a result, it's the surface which is making the difference between which chemical route is being followed. In the third one, if you remove an electron in the presence of oxygen, you can actually split the carbon-carbon bond and generate structures that are as shown. <laughs> This led us to think very deeply about the way in which electro electrochemistry and photochemistry can be combined into what we call photoelectrochemistry. Like the systems that I've showed already, there is a gap between filled and vacant orbitals in something like titanium dioxide. If we supply a photon that has enough energy to be equivalent to the band gap, you can promote an electron from the filled orbital to the empty orbital and can trap that extra electron by having an acceptor which is bound to the surface pull that electron out and be equivalent to a reduction. Similarly, if there's a hole in what was the highest filled orbital, that hole can be filled by accepting an electron from the donor. So by using absorption on a titanium dioxide particle or an electrode, you can get to the same place that we, you could by water splitting in that simple experiment you remember from your elementary school days. This is what is, we refer to as photoelectrochemistry, and it's a reaction which has been elaborated significantly for over 30 years. First publication in our group when this was 1980. Now one thing that helps a lot to get reactivity in a titanium dioxide surface is that there's bending of the bands. What this does is that when an electron is ejected into the titanium dioxide, it moves away from the surface. And as a result, anything that's absorbed on that metal, metal or solid surface has a chance to undergo reactivity rather than simply recombining with the higher lying energetic orbital. That recombination wastes energy, and it's one reason why the efficiency of this water splitting done this in indirect way uh, is not as, uh, as efficient as a process would, which would use photons directly. It does, however, harvest light. And on the next slide you can see, for example, if you take a particle of t titanium dioxide and metallize a small portion of the surface this is by taking a platinum salt and reducing in the presence of a reducing agent like sodium borohydride. You can use band gap irradiation to give H plus, this is a site that will accept an electron, and E minus, a site in which the electron is trapped by in a reducing equivalent. So an, something which is oxidized is reduced, O to R, and something that is reduced is oxidized. On this surface then, 
The idea of light harvesting by the surface as well as controlling subsequent activity is the key feature in photoelectrochemistry. Now in particular, if we talk about not just hydrogen, which of course is the holy grail for this kind of reaction, because hydrogen, if it can be split easily and efficiently, can be burned to give off energy, avoiding fossil fuels for, for completely. If, for, for example, though, you use organic molecules to d develop the photoelectrochemistry, there are several characteristics which, can, which allow specific control. Strongly surface adsorbed molecules are oxidized or reduced in preference to those which are in solution or weakly adsorbed. There are easily oxidizable functional groups which have a specific reactivity when bound on the surface of an oxide. This, the oxide is very efficient itself at absorbing light, or as we'll see later, we can attach a molecule which has a broader absorption spectrum. Excitons can split and opposite charges can migrate in different directions. And we can suppress recombination by using the surface to uh, attempt to control back electron transfer. This creates very long live charge separation, which is amenable to assembly on templates. And to the extent that we're able to manipulate the size and surface of the titanium dioxide prospect, we have an architecture which would be ideal for controlled oxidation and reduction reactions. Now when I say control reactions, basically what I'm talking about is having a potential which is greater than the oxidation potential of the compound that will induce an electron to be lost and the molecule will be oxidized. So here, for example, are some potentials just chosen routinely to show you uh, exactly what kind of band positions we're talking about. So notice the titanium dioxide, the second entry, has an oxidation potential of plus two volts. That means any molecule that has an oxidation potential lower than two volts will be oxidized on in the excited state of titanium dioxide. The conduction band is given as well in the right column. And here you see that for titanium dioxide, a, a reduction potential of minus 0.1 volts is obtained. That means it's possible to reduce as well. So if you keep those figures in mind, an oxidation potential of about 2 volts and a reduction potential a little negative of 0, you'll find that it's possible to affect charge separation very e easily. So here's what happened with charge separation. Our titanium dioxide particle is exposed to light. That light has enough of light to exceed the band gap. That has the effect, in turn, of allowing that electron to be taken up by the titanium, migrating to the site which is platinized, and then to take that in a reducing equivalent to generate a reductant product. At the same time, the oxidation potential has allowed an adsorbed donor to more adequately bind to the surface and to be oxidized as light is absorbed. So you can see in this way that if photon energy is stored in this charge separated species, that it would be possible to completely oxidize the material that we have at hand. Reduction product gives you hydrogen, and oxidation potential gives you water if this is done, uh, oxygen if this is done in water. But it can also be done in other media, and you can get oxidation products from that as well. For example, semiconductor water catalysis simply requires population of this 0.1 volt band. And on the left, what you can see is that hydrogen is generated. That's also enough potential to oxidize an acid, something like acetic acid, a normal biological product of many organisms. Acetic acid can be decarboxylated, generating a radical which can be used for synthesis. We also have been able recently to generate a water splitting device so that the additive potential that one gets across this array whether it's supported on glass or a plastic surface, allows you to develop enough potential so that you can do that experiment entirely without a, an electrical cell. You can do it just by the absorption of light.
because with five cells of this sort, there's enough potential that the light absorption can affect water splitting. Right now we're working on this, trying to optimize <coughs> the, the, uh, the, the criteria that go into assembling this cell, but it works and we're working on scale up. Now I mentioned to you that this works not just for water splitting, generating hydrogen, but it also works as a new means of controlling chemical reactivity. Virtually any molecule that has either a heteroatom or any conjugated double bonds will have an oxidation potential less than two volts, and as a result it will be able to be reduced or oxidized uh, in, the, in the transformation. So here's an amine, you see the nitrogen atom in the center of this molecule. After oxidation takes place, a cation is formed by giving up an electron from the original starting material. The oxidized species is then exposed to oxygen, typically in acetonitrile solution, giving an intermediate which splits apart, and you can see that the products are simpler. They've induced chemical cleavage by using an absorption of a photon on an irradiated uh, surface. Here, for example, are some other potentials. Remember the number that we said was critical was 2 volts. Anything that's less positive than 2 volts will undergo some kind of oxidation reaction on irradiated titanium dioxide. Notice at the left that you have chlorinated hydrocarbons. These are a pollution product in some cases, and it allows for easy cleanup of, say, spilled polychlorophenols. On the right are simple hydrocarbons or phenols, phenols or, or uh, catechols, and these too have oxidation potentials, which would be amenable to chemical induction of reactivity by TiO2. Another example that uh, we've pursued several years ago, about 15 years ago, was to look for, for the United States Army at ways of disposing of, of gases that they held for warfare. They were required to do so by treaty, and neighborhoods didn't want them burned. But a reaction that's done in solution on a solid catalyst, which can be filtered, is quite acceptable. And oxidation of the sulfide, as you can see to the sulfoxide or sulfone at the far right, represents a way in which there's little chance for release and a complete oxidation of a, a polluting material. So when we think about these uh, conversions, you can plan essentially what activity you expect in a way that a physical organic chemist would do. That's because a physical organic chemist worries not just about what products are formed, but the sequence of chemical bond closures and formations, which allow this to be understood. Physical organic chemistry, in other words, studies, first of all, the relationship between bond breaking and the re reagents, the intermediates that are formed. It's characterized by electron flow that forms intermediates along a reaction path, and it defines the relationship between molecular structure and reactivity in a way that before a reaction is run, you can predict what is likely to transpire. And lastly, it describes how local environmental effects can affect the course of chemical reactivity as these reactions have done. So let me illustrate to you how one would conduct an experiment in physical organic chemistry that does these things. Diphenylethylene is a molecule I mentioned earlier. It undergoes exposure to light in acetonitrile, a non-aqueous solvent, in the presence of oxygen, so that it undergoes cleavage of the carbon-carbon bond and forms instead a quinone. Uh, uh, benzophenone, rather. Uh, this was published in 1980. But subsequent work allowed us to demonstrate, both theoretically and by experiment, that formation of the radical cation that is immediately below the starting material is trapped by oxygen to give a four-membered ring in which those two oxygens constitute two of them, what we call a dioxetane. The dioxetane as a radical cation is reduced and split, and one gets the two products that are shown above, benzophenone and the corresponding aldehyde. This is typical of the kind of reactivity that one can ex examine by using photoelectrochemistry, because ultimately, if this is carried out again and again, notice that the products of this reaction 
have additional unsaturation. And because of that, they can undergo further oxidation. You could take any of these molecules at a given stage and stop the chemical exposure to light and have a synthetically useful material. The reaction shown here at low radiation conversions is 100%. It's a very clean reaction. A solid suspended in a liquid with a reactant, expose it to light, filter out the solid, and you have your product. So it's a very simple way of going about it. And by using the tools of physical organic chemistry, you can even describe the expected intermediates that are formed. So once again, this kind of interaction allows you to take a variety of organics and in a non-aqueous solvent in the presence of oxygen, convert virtually all the carbon atoms ultimately to their elemental state. So that means virtually any substituted organic material will go to carbon dioxide, halide, sulfide, water, or a nitrogen oxide. This is important because it represents a way of doing cleanup. There was a US patent issued about seven years ago to Adam Heller and his co-workers at the University of Texas in which this was suggested as a way to clean up oil spills. In other words, you take tons of titanium dioxide and spread it over an oil spill and let the material be converted to CO2 rather than to a pollutant spoiling the beaches. Now, I must admit that the rate by which the sun can deliver those photons is low compared to what British Petroleum has been able to unleash in the, in the Gulf. But nonetheless, it is a reaction that can be used probably as secondary or tertiary cleanup, even of a, a spill of that magnitude. Another example of this is that waste materials could be used for this kind of oxidative conversion. And Fujishima in, at the University of Tokyo about a decade ago showed that the trash could essentially be used as the reducing agent. So he used crushed roaches as the chemical reactant taking titanium dioxide and the reduced material, these roaches, which was converted to CO2 and therefore rendered uh, non-toxic. Perhaps a more appealing one is also a reaction that was studied by Fujishima. He found that if you coat windows with titanium dioxide, or in particular the, the walls of a hospital clinic, what you can do is the same kind of chemistry so that any organic material that comes onto those surfaces is converted to CO2. So there's an automatic cleaning inside a hospital room which is exposed to ultraviolet light. And also, uh, you of course have fewer cleaning on the outside of windows on skyscrapers uh, if you use this same technique. So the next time you're in a building that looks like the windows are a little shady, it's probably because there's titanium dioxide on those windows doing exactly this reactivity. So, photoelectrochemistry, in other words, is useful not only because it allows you to do oxidation reduction reactions, it allows you to think of new ways of getting rid of compounds that are of interest, but it also provides criteria of merit that would, we need to consider. If we're to make this a practical device for doing reactivity such I, I described to you, you have to absorb the sunlight very effectively. And titanium dioxide has an absorption maximum of about 410 nanometers if undoped. And because it's not doped, it won't absorb a large fraction of the visible spectrum. So you have to figure out a material that can be used or added as a dopant or a surface boundary agent that will allow you to bring photons to the site where chemical reactivity can take place. You need to have a material that has rapid charge ejection at the interface. The bands have to bend enough so that they move apart rather than recombining very quickly. You have to have a high surface area because otherwise you won't be able to have enough highly absorptive material at the site where the photon comes in. You need to have efficient long-range electron transfer, and by what that I mean that they're the charges, whether it's positive or negative, is trapped by a reagent. And that leads to the consequences that I showed you. Um, you have to have a re robust uh, uh, resistance to depletion. In other words, if the solid itself was sensitive to light and fell apart under continuous irradiation, it would not, not be good for the efficiency of the system. And of great significance is that these systems have to be easy to manufacture or fabricate 
and they have to retain their reactivity when scaled up to the kind of demands that would be put on such a system. So how could you address, first of all, this match with the solar spectrum? Well, one way is to recognize that in addition to doing band gap irradiation, as I've shown here, the, the substrate shown at the right, S1, um, when exposed to light, generates an excited state which has a different electron distribution. It will be dominated by the absorption of light by the sensitizer, S, which is attached, rather than the material itself. And there's been a great deal of work understanding that kind of sensitization. After you absorb a photon, that photon has enough energy to fall through a, a variety of states to generate a singly oxidized species. Whereas the electron can move in an electrochemical cell to an, the oppositely charged electrode where it can uh, be re renewed by accepting an electron from a donor. So in this way, at the far right side of the equations, you see you have a completely different array um, of electrons, but they have regenerated the material from which we started. And that's a characteristic of what is called a sensitizer. Absorption is not by the solid, as in the cases I showed you a few minutes ago, but instead is, is absorbed by a material which is itself highly absorptive. It absorbs light, does its thing, and then falls back into the position of where it was uh, originally generated. Now for this talk, I was trying to remember how long ago we had done this, and uh, turned out that this is my lab notebook mm -hmm. from 1979. Some of you weren't born then. But it shows some of the molecules that we've been using uh, to do exactly that kind of sensitization. And here they are drawn out in a little more, more clarity. Notice that with all of them, the, uh, the modified electrons, electrodes showed electrical effects that are parallel to what we, I earlier described for titanium dioxide. So generation of currents at this modified electrode is the first way you can determine efficiency. It's important to think about how we would evolve photocatalytic systems we started out with band gap irradiation, and we described that as a way of doing organic synthesis, of generating hydrogen, and as a mean for, for cleaning up pollution. We moved on to dye sensitization, one where the dye itself is absorbed rather than exciting this solid support. Our third approach is to think about the same experiment in which we've minimized the size of the, of, the, of the titanium dioxide species. We have, if you will, with that initial electro electrolysis experiment, taken one to, for metal and the other to titanium dioxide and miniaturized them so the light or wire connecting the two particles has gone to zero. As the two particles go to, to zero, they come into contact, and that contact allows you to have different parameters for the operation of the system. Absorption efficiency will be different, the yield of chemical reactions and so forth. These also provide ways in which two catalysts can come together to do this kind of enhanced reactivity. For example, you can have cadmium sulfide as a semiconductor bound on to titanium dioxide. And this represents one way by which doping takes place generating the excited state of TiO2 with charge-separated cations and anions. You can do this, as shown on the left side, by having cadmium sulfide on the outside. If we had a different act active catalyst in the middle, as shown on the right, your reactivity would be dominated completely by the surface interaction with titanium dioxide. So we've had a great deal of fun in looking at the inorganic chemistry of bringing together these kinds of molecules, putting small amounts of oxidizers or reducers into the species, and allowing it to undergo defined reactivity that follows from it. Let me give you an example of that. Here at the far left is the TiO2 with a small platinum island, the one that we found so effective for both destroying pollutants and for doing chemical oxidations. 
Uh, to its right, you can see that oxygen is reduced to superoxide, and the, the, any donor molecule is oxidized to the corresponding cation. Chemistry then follows it for, as a function of that. Now suppose on the second line, instead of having titanium exposed for most of the, the, the particle, you had the metal, platinum, at the center of a semiconductor and titanium dioxide completely surrounding it. Under those circumstances, you'll get the same reactivity because the photon will be absorbed by TiO2. Platinum will use a, be used as an island to trap the electron, but you'll undergo oxidation from a donor to acceptor. What would happen, though, if you simply inverted the place of platinum and TiO2? Well, what you'd find is that now there is no reactivity. That's because the platinum on the outside resists formation of an excited state, and even though these particles would be isomeric to the ones on the second line, the activity will be blocked, showing once again that it's the surface properties in conjunction with an absorbed photon which makes all the difference in photoelectrochemistry. Metal-capped semiconductors can be made. Nanoparticles will, are a very important part of chemistry that's evolving. And suppose you had a particle that was completely in, in, enclosed by another uh, material, for example, a metal. You could examine the same kind of charge separation that we've described in thinking about photoelectrochemistry, and I'm sure that later in the week some of the other talks will elaborate these kinds of particles in much more detail. It's one of the really exciting le levels, uh, questions available in chemistry right now. How can we devise nano, nanoscaled particles that have specific chemical reactivity? These can be called shell core clusters because you have a shell around a core molecule or a nanoparticle. You can conceive of these as conceptually as a blue center encapsulated with a green molecule or a green center encapsulated by a blue molecule. In other words, you don't have to know the chemistry very much to know that those two are going to be different, even though they're isomeric. You'll see differences in surface binding, because on one of the particles you have green on the outside, and the other par particle you have blue on the outside. You'll have charge carrier trapping in the core, just as we did with platinum in the preceding series. And you'll have surface band edge considerations if, if the, the active material is on the outside. So being able to think about shell core clusters is one way of thinking about absorbing light and getting it to the right place so that chemical reactivity can take place. Here's another example. Suppose you started with a, a salt of uh, either platinum or any of the other noble metals. You allowed it to interact over the arrow with a thiol because thiol has a very high affinity for noble metals that will bind very sig significantly. So at the top right, you have a, a metal particle completely encapsulated by these, this th thiol, which has an oxygen bound on the outside. The little squiggly molecules all around are the same thing, just to indicate zooming in on one chemical site. If, for example, the hydroxy group at the top right is used as a way of forming titanium particles, you can form a gold particle bound through these reagents to a titanium dioxide particle. And you can look at the characteristics that would result both chemically and structurally of having such a shell core cluster available. Very interesting material. Now, since we know from this slide that that top thiol, uh, this top thiol is governed by the strength of this gold uh, sulfur bond, it should be possible for us to say something about the length that, which separates this reagent from not only the central core, but also the titanium dioxide that's built up around it. If we do that, we could, for example, take any fluorescent molecule. Here, what we've done is taken a fluorine and have uh, changed the length of, this, of that uh, cell from 4 to 6 to 8 to 12 CH2 units. Now, if you take that molecule and you make a coating 
equally thick of each of these materials, you have what's shown here. That is for 12 CH2 groups, for um, 9 CH2 groups and 6, the intensity of the emission, the fluorescence that comes off of that system, uh, is in direct proportion to the length. What this tells you is that the distance does matter significantly in making these shell core clusters as it did in doping of the semiconductor to begin with. Now, not only do we know that the, there's an interaction between these materials to generate complex semiconductors, but you could actually tailor a molecule in, by ranking of the oxidation potential so that it goes from highest to lowest or lowest to highest. You can also use it by looking at a series of absorptive materials. So think, for example, if you had a series of materials, so these are called crokonic acids. Notice the, the one at the right. This one has, has three such, has actually five such oxygen atoms. One of them is replaced by a malleimid derivative once here, twice here, three times here. And what that does is every time an oxygen is replaced by this CHCN2 group, what you'll find is that there's an absorption shift in each one of their maximum. So although each one of these would not absorb the whole of the solar spectrum, the whole aggregate, this polymeric species that has variable numbers of groups attached to a, a significant backbone, would allow you to transfer only in one direction, from the high energy field, 415 nanometers, to the low one. So energy will migrate along this facet. This is much like what plants do in trying to collect and, and allow excited state transfer to proceed. We can do the same thing with electron transfer. So once again, you see derivatives of a common reagent the numbers below each one show the reduction potential. And it means that if you had a reduced species, they would all migrate to the, to the left as you're looking at them. So in other words, it's possible to make materials that have multiple chromophores arranged in a well-defined way that can be used to un absorb a large fraction of the solar spectrum. You can do this in the way that I've shown, or you could, for example, attach different uh, aromatic or uh, fluorescent groups. Oops. Here, for example, you have a dimethyl aniline. Here we go, right here is this dimethyl aniline. Here you have uh, an electron deficient arene. Here's a simple benzene ring. You can make these easily with 5, 10, 15, up to 50 units and can therefore ch change the absorption that, to which the particle is exposed in this way. It's really uh, quite uh, interesting to, to find out ways in which this absorptive interaction can take place in a whole series. And here, for example, is one where the backbone is made by opening up of a norbornene unit. So, what you see with these polymers is that by combining different polymers at well-defined sites, you can predict almost exactly what absorption characteristics evolve and can provide uh, the, the criterion that would result in very efficient photosensitization. There's another way that you can do that, and that's by building up molecules around a central core, what is called dendromers. So we here have a dendromer. Uh, in which the first material represents, sorry, this first substrate shown at your top left is an, uh, let me see for a second here. I think it's ruthenium, I can't see very well. It's ruthenium trisbipi. Ruthenium trisbipi, and then it, what we've done is replaced by substitution on one of the bipyridyl rings once, twice, three times. So this is a group that has three times as much as the absorption on the outside. Whereas here we have this same rubipi core and one, two, three, four, five, six absorption units. In other words, what you can do is have stronger absorption 
by having multiple chromophores located at defined distances around a central core. And there's been a great deal of theoretical in interest in how the chromophores interact in this very uh, highly constrained facet. For example, if you look at, at one more unit in this series, here again is the, the rubipi, completely covered by s substrates of this sort, the third generation Denimber. If we go further, you can even see you can see that even trying to draw this molecule creates vacancies near the rubipi core. And we found that the vacancies are an additional way of controlling chemistry, because only those molecules that are of the correct size to migrate in toward the center of the oxidation reduction catalyst will be activated. Those that are too large will be excluded. So you can selectively oxidize or reduce a, chemi a, a chemical according to its size and access onto the central core. Just to give you a picture, from theoretical generation. Here's what the first dendromer looks like. You can see that the three units are displayed in such a way that they hardly interact at all. Here's the third generation dendromer, and you can see that the approach along the, the blue line to the center of the reagent is blocked on several other directions. You can also see that if you look at the second generation, that there are groups that are positioning themselves in such a way that they can self-quench. And as a result, the, the chemistry which is observed is very much less efficient. So this gives us design criterion by which we can go forward in understanding these systems. You can see this also by looking at a spectrum. The spectrum with 0, 1, 2, 3 shows increasingly strong absorption in the visible region of the spectrum. And in particular, this, what is called plasmon band, uh, responds, corresponds very effectively to the kind of redox catalyst we've described earlier. <coughs> Finally, let me show you one other catalyst. This is a palladium catalyst. Palladium uh, is used for a, a number of reactions. But as you can see, like the one I showed you, the third generation, it has lots of room very near the surface. So small molecules can get in, react, and come out, whereas larger ones are blocked by the channels on the dendromer. So what I hope you've seen here is that the same kind of catalyst that we have looked, looked at for absorption in photoelectrochemical cells also have unique chemical characteristics in terms of platinum. This is of great importance to a lot of people interested in catalysis because without this covering, the pal palladium in these reactions precipitates very rapidly. But it's 10 times more reactive despite the fact that surface approach onto the catalytic surface takes place uh, at a different rate. So I hope what I've been able to show you today is that by logically thinking about structure, using the simple principles that donors are oxidized and acceptors are reduced and the chemistry differs on solids, we've been able to put together a, a program that takes advantage of these absorption phenomena and potentially may be of some use in the future. Let me uh, acknowledge the fact that over the years I've had a lot of coworkers who've elaborated far more than I can tell you in today's tech lecture it's been supported since 1976 by the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation, and in the years I was in Texas at, by the Robert A. Welsh Foundation as well. So I thank you very much for the chance to speak with you. I hope some of you will find the idea of doing solid reactions, using solids as catalysts, to be something that you'd find to be very interesting. I've sure had a lot of people who have held, so far uh, held that same view. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne, for a fantastic talk. I think despite that we are uh, a little late, we have time for one or two questions. If you raise your hand, somebody. Here's one. How easy to scale up? your system? 
Uh, it's easy to scale up uh, if you're talking about pounds. It's very difficult to scale up if you're talking about tons. And we would like to do this by tons if we really wanted to have a chemical factory based on oxidative chemistry of TiO2. TiO2 itself is a very inexpensive catalyst. I think it's 10 cents a pound. It's mined in Utah in the United States. Uh, it's used in sunscreen. You know, the white powder that you have in sunscreen is titanium dioxide. It's also used in salad dressing, so probably in, not only outside but inside. <laughs> You have titanium dioxide. So the cost of the, of the reagent is not the scaling problem, it's the chemistry when you get to ton quantities. You know, what, one of the very pretty, pretty things that comes out of your lecture is I, you, you sort of juxtapose the hard matter synthesis and the soft matter. So we, we look at the elegance of putting these dendromers together, and I think the other thing it illustrates is how primitive our ability is to make a really well-defined, as well-defined as we like, nanoparticle or nanoparticle assembly, or, or there are lots of different kinds of titanium dioxide, as you know, and there's, there's a current feeling that sometimes it's even the interface between phases or a disordered phase immersed in an ordered phase that right. is, is most catalytically That's why we important. found the shell core clusters to be so important because we right. would have the ability to try to characterize that interface between the metal and semiconductor or two semiconductors. Right. Very important point, Tobin. <laughs> Glad I didn't drop it. Um, the, you, you, uh, certainly during the first half of your lecture, you used the word light, 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 but you didn't actually define the light. And of course, uh, the water splitting system, for example, and titanium dioxide is white, and the light that really it absorbs is UV radiation rather than That's visible correct. radiation, right? I, I think I mentioned that its absorption maximum is 410, and it, it's a steep absorption maximum at about 400, so it absorbs essentially UV that's why we need photosensitization in order to pick up the visible region. But once you add a photosensitizer, of course, you change the redox chemistry that you were yes, talking you about at the beginning of, the, of, the, of your lecture. Exactly, yeah. and that's part of the challenge of the scale-up. Yeah. <laughs> I have a quick question. So what's the efficiency of your system compared to the existing uh, photoelectric systems or uh, as you were decide, defining the water splitting systems? You, for, for chemical conversion, it depends on the uh, oxidizability of the substrate. Mm -hmm. But it, it can, um, it's typically between 5 and 15% for chemical oxidations. When formulated as a photovoltaic, I think that titanium dioxide itself Again, with the absorption problem, only UV lights being used. Uh, a, a, a dependable, robust system with greater than 12%, I don't think, has been described without substantial doping, which you'll probably hear about later in the week. Don't believe him. Um, I'm really intrigued by your ruthenium BIPI systems, and I just wonder whether you've done any chiral reactions with those. You know, we have not, and we should be able to because, because they're there's a chiral set environment. Up for it. They're right. lovely. Yeah. And size protected as well, size defined. Well, if there are no more questions, I thank you sincerely for your attention and for the invitation to come see your wonderful country. Thank you.